Okay, um, welcome everybody to the session AI for Science. My name is Axel Berg. I'm Innovation Manager at SURF and I will host this um, discussion panel. Um, let me move to the first slide. Just a second, okay. So let me, uh, I will start by introducing uh, briefly the topic of AI for Science. Um, and the, the setup of the session is such that I'll ask um, the panelists each to introduce themselves by um, talking about their uh, topic of research and how they apply AI. And um, in parallel, uh, you will be ask, asked for your opinion uh, through a Mentimeter uh, panel. So we hope to have an interactive discussion with the panel and with you uh, in the audience. Um, one more thing that I should mention is that um, we will not use the chat uh, function um, for this session. Uh, only if time allows on the, at the end, uh, we will open the session for uh, any questions that you might have. So um, let's get started. <coughs> Well, the application of AI technologies for scientific discovery is rapidly increasing. Um, this ranges from pattern uh, recognition and pattern discovery uh, in high resolution images in uh, experimental data, understanding complex organic chemistry, all the way to enhancing numerical simulations through deep learning. And this is, in my view, not only an evolution, it might also be the start of a revolution. Uh, for scientific uh, uh, discovery. And I would like to illustrate that by two quotes. One quote I took from the NWO Artificial Intelligence Research Agenda for the Netherlands, and it says, across all sciences, AI techniques are beginning to have a major impact on the way scientific knowledge is produced, tested, refined, and revised. Another quote I took from a very interesting report uh, AI for Science, it's from the United States, um, and one of the main authors is uh, Professor Rick Stevens from Aragon National Labs, uh, and their quote, the quote I took from that report uh, is from chemistry to material sciences to biology, the use of machine learning techniques opened potential to move beyond today's heuristic-based experimental design and discovery to AI-enhanced strategies of the future. So I think this is all a good reason to have a discussion on AI for research, right? Um, so we will discuss in this panel session uh, the following topics. What are the main challenges in implying AI in science? What are the most important needs to support scientific research? Uh, what are the largest opportunities in applying AI in science? Uh, and if time, is, time allows, we will discuss uh, and look a bit into the future. What can we expect from AI in science in 10 years from now? Will it really transform the way we do scientific uh, research uh, uh, as we know it today? Then I come to um, uh, the people in the panel. I'm very happy to introduce to you Christoph Weniger. He's Associate Professor for Astrophysics. Um, at the Grappa Institute of the University of Amsterdam. He's on my left side. Um, then, um, remotely, not in the studio, but remotely, uh, there is Francesco Chiompi. He is Associate Professor uh, Computational Pathology from the Radboud Medical Center. And then, last but not least, also on my left hand here in the studio, is Bernd Ensink. Um, he's Professor of Computational Chemistry and he's also Director of the AI for Science Lab at the University of Amsterdam. So, um, to warm up to this topic, um, I asked each of the three panelists to have a very short presentation on what their research topic is about and how they apply AI for science. And we start with uh, Bernd Ensing. Thanks. Bernd, I hand over one. Yeah, thank you very much, Axel. Um, yeah, so I, I prepared uh, one or two slides for this. Um, um, so f let me first say something about the research that we do. It's on the molecular simulation of uh, materials and, and chemistry. And um, uh, we combine in these simulations uh, quantum chemistry to look at the molecular structure. 
with molecular dynamics to look at the motions of atoms and molecules to study chemical reactions and other molecular properties in all sorts of materials and um, environments. And uh, what you see here is an example of an, uh, such an environment. It's a protein, actually, an enzyme. And we study, um, uh, this enzyme is called hydrogenase, uh, which is super efficient in making hydrogen, which we find interesting to make a fuel. And we take inspiration from the catalytic side to make artificial uh, catalysts, for example. And um, so that, that's one of my interests, uh, electrocatalysis and electrochemistry. Um, for one, because, well, I think electrochemistry will be very important to solve some uh, important um, problems uh, in sustainability, for example, um, CO2 capture, uh, producing um, sustainable fuels uh, and storing uh, wind and solar energy, for example, but also uh, nitrogen fixation. And so in my lab, we combine fundamental science with uh, um, well, industrial applications. Uh, maybe I should also say something about AI for Science. That's a new initiative uh, in the uh, Faculty of Sciences at the University of Amsterdam, which uh, aims to connect uh, experts on machine learning and, uh, and artificial intelligence from the um, Informatics Institute with uh, the domain sciences, so the different institutes um, in biology, um, ecology, uh, physics, astrophysics, and, um, and chemistry. And so maybe I get something to say about that uh, later on, but um, let me leave it at that for now. Okay, thank you, Grant. Next up is uh, Christoph. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, my research is uh, about dark matter, so I'm interested in figuring out with my research group what the nature of dark matter in the universe is. Uh, about 80% of the mass in the universe is dark matter. We know it's not a particle, or it's not the same material that makes planets and stars. Instead, it's most likely a new fundamental particle uh, that we haven't dis uh, detected in experiments at Earth so far. Um, even the, the mass of this hypothetical particle is unknown. It can range within decades of orders of magnitude, and there have been quite a few ideas of, of what dark matter could be. So there's, there are a range of candidate models that are interesting. All those models are consistent with observations of the universe at large, but they differ if one, if one looks at details, and so these details matter if you want to make progress in, in understanding dark matter. In my research group uh, in Amsterdam, we look at various astrophysical uh, data sets like gravitational waves, gamma rays, stellar streams, um, radio emission from neutron stars, and so on, um, to search for subtle clues for, for the nature of dark matter. Um, interestingly, all these problems require that one solves uh, what is called the inverse problem. So in, in that context, the first step is simple. We start with, with physical parameters for dark matter, with hypotheses about dark matter, put them in a simulator and end up with synthetic, uh, synthetic data. The difficult part is now to compare that data with observations and then work backward what the observations imply for, for the parameters, like dark matter mass. Um, traditionally, this has been done using likelihood-based techniques, uh, which are very computationally expensive and often forced to, to simplify models. Um, and this is where AI solutions like simulation-based inference uh, can play a huge role. The idea is here to train a neural net to directly do the mapping back from observed data to the parameters of interest. And this is typically far more simulation efficient and, uh, and allows us to make models more realistic and complex. One of the concerns is here that, that we use a deep neural net for doing the mapping, and uh, they often con uh, considered black boxes mm -hmm. uh, and hard to interpret, but this doesn't have to be the case. And let me give you an example in context of, of some of our work, uh, strong gravitational lensing. If, if you have a very massive distribution like a, of, of mass, like a galaxy or galaxy clusters, it acts as a gravitational lens and distorts the light behind it, which leads to these ring and arc-like structures that then inform us about the dark matter of the lens. Uh, we found that one can drastically uh, improve the analysis of the images now by merging both this forward simulation and the backward inference step into one single unit uh, using differentiable programming. And we, yeah, in this way, arrived at the lensing pipeline that is much faster and more versatile than, than other approaches, and, and we will use it to study dark matter in the near future. It's also a nice uh, example for, in some sense, white box deep learning, because in some sense we replace here the weights and biases of deep neural nets with uh, physically meaningful quantities, with fluxes and mass distributions. And I think both differentiable programming and, and simulation-based inference will 
play a larger role in the physical sciences in, in the future, and it's exciting to be part of that. Thanks, Christoph. Then we move and see if that's technically uh, working well to Francesco Chiompi. Hi, Francesco. How are you? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. Okay. Hi. Good afternoon, and thanks uh, for having me. Yes, so um, you are going to talk uh, a few minutes about your topic of research and how you apply AI. Please go ahead. Yes. Um, so my uh, research focuses on uh, computational pathology, which essentially is the analysis of digital pathology slides. Um, see if I can see my uh, slides. Um, yes. So what is digital pathology? Well, it's about the analysis of uh, histopathological samples. So you see here in the top left is the resection of, uh, of a tumor. Uh, which is then cut and stained and put in a glass light. And then typically a pathologist, so a specific type of physicians, look at this uh, glass light under the microscope. But uh, now we are in the era of uh, digital pathology, so we can have scanners that can digitize these uh, glass lights. And essentially what they do, they take the glass light, they identify the, the tissue, and then they take a lot of very high resolution pictures and they stitch them together to create what we call a host light image. It's really a huge image. It's about 30 to 50 gigabytes of data uncompressed if you take a single image. So it's really a lot of data. And uh, I prepared a short video to um, actually uh, let you see a bit how this looks like. So this is a, a section of a rectal carcinoma. And then uh, you see, when you zoom in, it, it works a bit like Google Maps. You really have uh, thousands and thousands of cells, and you can really zoom in up to the cell level. And what we see here, these are um, tumor cells, and they are stained in blue using a hematoxylin. It's like a chemical uh, component. And then the rest of tissue is, is stained in different flavors of pink. So you can really zoom in up to the cell level and really see the, the details of, of the cancer. So uh, the question is, how can we use AI here? What do we do with AI to, to help the pathologist? Well, uh, there are essentially two main goals that we have. One is to help the pathologist to do uh, the diagnosis better, more efficient, more accurate, and also to help the pathologist to understand the disease and then select the best treatment for the patient. So one example is like this slide here is a, a section of breast cancer. And when the breast cancer is diagnosed, then a pathologist have to do a number of things to characterize this, uh, this cancer. And one of the things they have to do is they have to detect and count the, the they call the proliferating tumor cells. So the tumor cells that grow very fast. And these are called mitotic figures. And they look a bit different from the other cells. And there can be a few or thousands of these in a single uh, specimen. So now you imagine how big it is, I showed you before. And they have to find these this tiny cells that I put here in these green circles. And uh, you can imagine that this is time consuming, is subjective, and then it can really uh, depend also what, who, uh, which pathologist actually looks at this light to uh, get the, the, a, a specific type of, of diagnosis. So this is called the grading procedure. And based on this grading, actually the type of treatment that the patient gets can change. So the, the help that we can give to the pathologist with AI is essentially something that I, like I'm showing here to detect this mitosis automatically before even the pathologist look at the case. And then what we can do, we can compute some kind of density of all these mitosis over the, the slide and then show uh, very easily the, the hotspot, which is the region where pathologists have to count these mitosis based on the, on the guidelines. Uh, another thing that we could do with AI is try to understand the morphology of the tissue. And here I'm showing uh, an example of uh, colorectal cancer. And then a part of this tissue I show as uh, segmented. So essentially with AI, we can distinguish different types of tissue and then label each and every single pixel in this huge image with a different color and try to understand then the, the morphology, the spatial architecture of the tumor. So how to use this, say, uh, building blocks to address questions in pathology, but also in oncology? Well, I picked two examples. One is the way breast cancer patients are treated in the clinic nowadays. This is called new adjuvant chemotherapy. It's chemotherapy given before surgery. And if you look at the specific type of breast cancer, which is called triple negative breast cancer, you see that only half of the patients more or less respond to the treatment, which means that the other half are actually not treated in the optimal way. And if you look at the 
context of immunotherapy and lung cancer in this case, there are some guidelines in the clinic to select patients that will get this treatment, which is here on the left, but among these patients, only a fraction will respond to the treatment. It's about 30 to 40 percent. And we also know that the fraction of the patients that are not currently treated could eventually respond. So essentially, there is a big question about having what are called the biomarkers to actually select uh, patients to get one of these types of treatment. And uh, our research is basically on uh, using AI to understand the disease, extract these biomarkers from the tissue, and use them to help pathologists and oncologists to uh, select the right treatment for the right patient. Great. Uh, thank you, Francesco. Um, so now I think we are quite warmed up. Uh, as you, you can see that in a few minutes we dive, in, dive deep into uh, the scientific research and how AI is applied. So now we come, uh, go back to a little bit higher level. And if the first topic we would like to discuss with the panel is what are challenges and needs uh, in applying AI in scientific research. So the question to the panel is what do you see as the main challenges uh, that's the first question. And in parallel, the um, uh, audience could already try to log in to menti.com because we um, will later ask you uh, the same question. Uh, so use the code 71128048. So while listening to the, uh, the first answers of the panel, uh, you can uh, also take time to log in to menti so we can uh, move on fast uh, after that. So. Uh, let me start by um, Bernd. What do you see as the main challenges in applying AI for science? Yeah, so that's a very broad question. I yeah. think there's many, many um, challenges actually out there and we're trying to attack all of them at the same time, I suppose, but I could mention a few of them already. Mm -hmm. One would, would be yeah, error control, right? So how do you, um, how do you check the errors, right? So of course you, you train, on some data, you minimize uh, some loss function, and uh, but the actual value of that loss function is, is of course useless, right? So, in a typical way to do it is, for example, train a bunch of neural networks, for example, or whatever machine learning algorithm you have, and then see if they converge. So you have different algorithms, see if they converge on the same answer. But that still doesn't tell you so well um, on how accurate it is, and especially not when you then apply it for um, outside your training. So this is still something very much in development, I think, and it's, a, it's, it's quite a challenge. Yeah, interesting. How do you look at uh, the main challenges uh, you see, Christoph? Yeah, there are quite a few. So <laughs> one, um, one that certainly always comes up is how to actually select the right uh, machine learning algorithm for a specific task. So mm -hmm. there, we started two years ago uh, looking into the literature and, and diving into this. And it was pretty confusing, so it took us a while to, to figure out what, what is interesting to do, what not. And uh, what part of the reasons is that um, often the algorithms are... So w one of the challenges in dark matter research is that we're often looking for very low signal uh, to noise uh, signals. So signals that are just above the noise level statistically. Um, and most machine learning algorithms seem to be built for m complex signals that have a that have a large variance that are very significant. We have seen the, the cancer images. They, they are not extremely noisy. Whereas in, a, in dark matter research, often we have a very good idea what the background should be, and we look for a very noisy signal on top of that. Algorithms are not necessarily targeted for that, so we had to de start developing our own. And um, yeah, so that, that's interest. It's, it's both opportunity and a challenge in that. Yes, okay, so um, choosing the right uh, neural network uh, to, uh, to use, Error uh, correction, error functions. Uh, Francesco, uh, what do you see as main challenges in applying AI for science? Yeah, so I agree with them that there are a number of topics for me. I will, uh, I will be a bit more practical. For me, mm -hmm. it's data. Um, I mean, I work in the medical field, and potentially there is a huge amount of data available out there. The problem, and actually it's also where I spend quite some of my time, is um, identifying this data, uh, getting access to this data, then teaming up with uh, uh, other research groups, other medical centers to um, uh, collect this data, ensure high quality of this data, transfer this data from one hospital to another hospital for research, for example. 
So this is, uh, a, a, this is let's say, a practical challenge, if you like, but uh, uh, it's something that we face uh, quite often in the medical field. Yeah, I see. So we heard the opinion of uh, the three uh, panel members. Now we uh, let's see, uh, let's move to the audience and see how they think about this topic. Um, so we move to Mentimeter. Uh, and the question is, what do you see as the main challenges in applying AI for science? So it's the same question. Um, we prepared a number of options you can choose from. And there's a maximum of three options you could select. So let's see if this works. So go to menti.com through your browser or through your uh, mobile phone and use the code 71128048. And we see the first um, um, uh, opinions coming in. So let me uh, repeat what uh, uh, we provided as answers. So availability of AI knowledge. Uh, if you are a domain scientist, how do I get um, uh, AI knowledge in my team? Uh, combining scientific domain knowledge with AI knowledge is another, um, could be another challenge. Uh, availability of infrastructure, or, or availability, availability of sufficient data, handling data from multiple resources, ensuring data quality, uh, finding the right machine learning model for my data, just I think as Christoph uh, mentioned, uh, but also ethical issues, so explainability or responsibility. So let's wait a few seconds we see already quite some trends <coughs> so Bernd if you look at the response of the audience what how would you reflect on this well so the first thing that jumped out and it's still the maximum at the moment is ethical issues and I should say that um, yeah as, as, a, as an let's say exact science you know nerdy scientist uh, th th these are of course, always ignored. You know, I always think, well, you know, the, the stuff I work on is just for understanding, in my case, molecular simulations, for example. How, how could this possibly be misused and how could this possibly hurt anyone? Why should I worry about ethical issues? And this is, of course, um, well, well-known uh, mistake from, from scientists. And, uh, and I find it very interesting that this now pops up as, a, you know, one of the important challenges. And I can say that, for example, in, in, in Amsterdam, we have now the Humane AI initiative, which is a very nice initiative that really worries about, about this. So I'm, I'm not an expert on this. There's also a Horizon 2020 uh, topic, I think, so a European initiative called Humane AI. And, uh, and so one of the things that, you know, that they say is <clears throat> we always think that uh, whatever we develop um, is supplementing, uh, ex is an extension of you know, our, our dreams and wishes and whatever we want to make. But in reality, um, actually we, we, we can hardly predict how it will change society and our behavior, right? And so it's something to, uh, yeah, to think about. So mm -hmm. suppose that now, you know, in the next five or 10 years, everyone will have AI in his hands to do, yeah, scientific research. Will that actually change our behavior, right? And um, I, I'm not saying that that should be bad or, but it's something mm -hmm. that's interesting to think about. Too. Yeah, so I moved to Christophe for, with a similar question. How do you look at it? And um, yeah, so the, probably should get to the mic. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, the second uh, point that, uh, that is here raised is combining scientific domain knowledge with, with AI knowledge, and that's indeed a challenge. In, in some sense, uh, AI helps most where, where, if one looks at the hardest problems on the science side. And so to really appreciate the, the intricacies of, of this particular, let's say, analysis problem, one has to be one of the experts uh, that, that is working on that. Um, so, so ideally, uh, in our case, dark matter researcher, expert on gamma rays would become an eye specialist or vice versa in order to really understand uh, where one can make a difference. And, and that's something that's, uh, that I, I think is probably mostly solved through education. So it's, it's very nice to see that there are more and more now physics students who also do a double master and actually are afterwards have, have education both in AI and, and uh, oh, wow. physics. And, this wasn't the case two years ago or three years ago, but now there are quite a few people on the, on the PhD market, to, so to say, that I, I think have also great potential to drive the field and, and drive development. So that, that's very good to see. And that's more to say about this point. Yeah, uh, thanks. And uh, Francesco, um, 
How do you look at that? Do you recognize, for example, the ethical issues, um, responsible AI or even explainable AI? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, the both uh, um, highly rated uh, uh, questions, I think, are, are, are relevant. And uh, I can say a, a few words about both of them. Um, so maybe briefly about uh, having domain knowledge uh, together with AI expertise. I think why well, I can talk about my experience. Um, as I said before, I work in a hospital, so it might sound a bit like a, a strange situation to have an AI team working inside a hospital, but actually, I think it's a, a very good model because um, I see in my team, we really have um, the opportunity to collaborate very closely with, with pathologists, with radiologists. Uh, so uh, like my room, we work in the lab and then the next door is a pathologist and then the next door is another pathologist. So I can just knock at their door and then show some results and say, can we have a look at what my AI model is predicting? Do you think it's correct? Can you make some manual annotations for me to train a better model? So I think uh, one option would be to have indeed like the physician, like getting interested into AI and learning the, the tricks of it. Um, but uh, another uh, model would be like to have a, a multidisciplinary team actually where you have uh, computer scientists, engineers, uh, physicians all together. Mm -hmm. um, then about the other thing about uh, the ethical aspect, I think yeah, in the medical field is extremely relevant uh in all aspects ranging from you know data collection you always have to make sure that you collect data of patients that have given informed consent then you have to fully anonymize the data um, you have to transfer the data in a secure manner and then when it comes to the model um i think the explainability is is a very highly discussed uh, topic which is kind of interesting in the in the medical field because Actually, if, if you look at drugs and physicians that are recommending drugs to uh, to patients, probably physicians don't know how most of these drugs work. And uh, you, you could at some point also have a similar discussion about AI um, making recommendations for, you know, about diagnosis and uh, about uh, um, uh, how a patient should be should be treated. The, the thing is explainability is extremely important and uh, uh, and also the, the accuracy of a system is important. So a system has to work, has to give the right prediction, has to help the, the physicians, the pathologists in this case, to, to do their, uh, their diagnosis better. Uh, and it has to be uh, validated in a, in a similar way as, as drugs are validated. So drugs are uh, validated by uh, uh, randomized controlled trials. And then also for, for AI systems in, in the medical field, there should be a similar approach to, to validation to assess the accuracy and the impact that they should have in the clinic. Next to, of course, uh, uh, explainability. But I would say that uh, accuracy is also uh, very important. Well, thank you, Francesco. Um, we will move to the next um, a question for the Mentimeter, the audience, uh, and it concerns the most important needs to support your research. Of course, uh, challenges are coupled to needs. Um, and I move my slide. So um, the audience can already answer the question, what, are, what do you see as the most important needs to support your research? Um, possible answers are better collaboration between domain scientists and AI experts, better funding opportunities if needed, better infrastructure, availability of performance, better expert support, better education for students. Um, well, we can make a whole list. This is the selection we made. So please fill out um, um, your answers and I will move to the panel to see what their opinion is. Uh, let me start with um, Christoph. Yep. So well, uh, you, you can, you... already popping up. <laughs> uh, I should get closer to the microphone. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think um, we all benefit certainly from better collaboration between domain scientists and AI experts. So one way this happens at Amsterdam is through the uh, AI for Science Initiative. Probably Bernd is, is going to say more about this. Um, and, and this collaboration is really important because, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, of, yeah, often the, the needs of especially in particle physics or in astrophysics for algorithms are n not exactly aligned with, with the algorithms that are out there in the machine learning world. So I, also there uh, it is important, for instance, 
yeah, what, what we would like to do uh, often, or what we care about, is scientific discoveries of new particles, gravitational waves, so to speak. So th this includes multiple components. One is statistical significance of the signal, but also then, if, if you have a detection, you have to actually find it plausible and, and explainable. And, um, and using neural networks just for that would typically uh, be alone, uh, would be hard, it's, it's hard to convince yourself about discoveries just based on a neural net. Um, so these techniques of modeling data in a forward way, combining this with, uh, in, with neural nets that can be, or uh, differential programming that can be interpreted, where the internals can be understood, where you understand what are the fluxes of individual sources and so on, uh, plays there a huge role. And this is something that we can only do together. And, um, in particular, talking to experts on probabilistic programming uh, has been always super fruitful for our research. Mm -hmm. So, Bernd, you also had a remar uh, still remark on the main challenges, I think. Uh, so, can yeah. you make your remark and then um, also have a few words um, sure. on what do you think, what do you see as yeah, the most important? I just issues? want to briefly comment on the smallest one, actually, which was, um, if I remember well, um, um, infrastructure, mm -hmm. which was scored very low. So that gives some hope that everyone has good trust in surf facilities, I would think. I don't know. And uh, also no one in the audience actually tried to buy GPUs because that's really a problem. And we, we want to buy our own uh, infrastructure uh, uh, now in, in the computational chemistry group and also for AI for science. And it's impossible to get uh, good GPUs at the moment. So that's just a side remark. But now concerning this, of course, you, you know, what do you need? Uh, you know, everything better is obviously, of course, better. Um, I must say, you know, at least at the University of Amsterdam, we are working on all of these things. For example, in the AI for Science, so this collaboration is going very well. We're working on set, setting up new courses for master's students, also in chemistry, and bachelor's students as well. Um, so actually, the thing, again, here the thing scores lowest, which is uh, better funding opportunities. Um, yeah, I, I, I find that actually the most important one, uh, and especially for small projects, right? So you can always try big projects with many people, but if you just want in your group one PhD student focused on, you know, your topic, then you, my experience is, now it's getting better, but my first experience was really that um, committees would say, well, you don't have the expertise of the AI, or you have the expertise of the AI, but you don't understand this uh, scientific domain, right? Mm -hmm. So I found it very difficult because it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a multidisciplinary thing, and then to get funding for that sort of things is always, is always difficult. Okay, so yep. we move to Francesco. Francesco, can you say which, two, which of the two options would you select from the list? Um, yeah, it's a good uh, point. Uh, from here, it's difficult to see what is the first option that... Um, it's collaboration between want. domain scientists and AI experts. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that one I, I mentioned a bit uh, before. I think uh -huh. that's very important. I mean, for me, it's actually the case being in a, in a multidisciplinary setting. I think funding uh, is extremely important and actually ties in with uh, with some of the other points because you can have uh, you know a good uh, uh, education infrastructure to train students and then you can they can become expert in AI and then you can hire them as PhD students and of course you need funding and then the funding it's also what you need to to build an infrastructure to buy the GPUs to set up your cluster or whatever so all these things are are quite connected. So I would say that uh, indeed, if I have to point to one in particular, I would say indeed funding, because it's kind of the source of all the other things that come as a consequence. Mm -hmm. And so I move to Christoph. Um, would you say that uh, it's in particular more difficult to find funding opportunities for AI for science research? Um, or is that funding, or is it, is it more specific for this type of research to find funding opportunities, or is it in general difficult to find funding opportunities? Um, my, my experience is that it, um, it's difficult to find funding opportunities if proposals are targeted on, on developing AI methods if you, if you come from a physics direction. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in that case, it's important to build everything about a, a specific scientific case, but often the methods that one develops are actually applicable to a larger range of, 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 uh, of problems. So in, in some sense, there is a mismatch. Having actually support um, f 
for AI development for a specific entire scientific field would be quite useful. Do you have the same experience, Bernd? Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I have the same experience, yeah. So you have to build your case on a, on a real application, um, try to get the money for that, but then, um, yeah, you, then of course you, you try to do the, the development, uh, you know, on site within that project as well. But you, so when you try to get the funding, yeah, you, you always have to uh, think of the big picture and make sure that it's uh, widely applicable, et cetera. Yeah, yeah so, so I think we talk now, uh, um uh, about the um, challenges and needs. Um, let's move, so that, that, that's more from what, what, what is difficult and what do I need to do better. Uh, but I think AI for Science also uh, provides great opportunities, right? Because it's, it's new, in some ways it's a new way of doing science. Um, so the question to the panel is now, where do you see the largest opportunities in applying AI for Science? Um, Francesco, could you briefly mention your opinion on that yeah so um, for me uh, one of the biggest opportunities at least uh, in my research field is uh, when you have um, essentially uh, a sufficiently large amount of data available with all the problematics that I mentioned before but suppose that that you get there that you get a, a very large data set you collect a a lot of patients and then you know what actually happened to those patients in terms of you know survival uh, response to a specific type of treatment and there is currently no equation to actually explain that so uh, i think an opportunity for ai is that it can learn uh, from the data it can find uh, patterns that are potentially unknown from the data if trained with a sufficiently large amount of high quality data and then ideally like the the the, the that the ultimate goal uh, would be like to have a system that can take, uh, you know, input data and can predict directly from the data what will happen to that patient if you give it diff uh, some type of treatment or if you, um, you know, indeed in instead uh, uh, select one treatment instead of the other, um, and and that would be, uh, you know, uh, also combined with. Uh, some of the um, uh, prior knowledge, let's say, because there are some some mechanisms, some some patterns, some morphological features in the tumor, for example, that um, give indications about uh, how the patient will behave. Uh, so this current knowledge, together with the, the opportunity that we have with AI to discover potentially new patterns uh, that can shed the light essentially on these mechanisms, I think that would be that would be really a great opportunity that we could uh, that we could have with AI. Mm. Thanks, uh, Bernd. Yes. Yeah, so where, where do you see opportunities? I, I so I see I see I, I want to mention two. So one is um, so-called surrogate modeling, which which is basically a fancy name for you know models of models. Mm -hmm. And um, so we you, we model uh, chemical reactions, and so we, as, as I said, we combine quantum chemistry with molecular simulations, and that means every step, every femtosecond or so, we, we have to solve a Schrodinger equation, get the electronic structure, get the interactions between atoms, and then we can move them, uh, propagate them a little bit, and then you know. But that means, well, you know, first of all, we are yeah one of the heavy uh, users of uh, Surfsara. Uh, mm -hmm. um, HPC uh, and, and the national supercomputer because these are heavy calculations, right? And we can do small systems for short times, you know, a nanosecond is already an eternity. But if we can train um, machine learning potentials for these interactions, then we don't have to solve certain equation anymore. Every step, it's much faster. It's like 10 to 100 times faster. And so now we can simulate things that before we could not. So that's a great opportunity. For example, so I mentioned electrocatalysis, which is a complicated system of an, an interface of a solid with an with a, with a electrolyte, chemistry on top, etc., a potential, electro, electric potential, etc., a gradient in well, it's a complicated systems. And that's something that I think we can now do. So that's one. And the second is that because of the availability of data, we can now also use data for other purposes than they were intended to. Uh, and I want, again, I want to mention one example. Mm -hmm. So in the AI for Science lab, for example, we use um, um, Doppler radar data for, you know, seeing if it's raining uh, all over Europe, right? Mm -hmm. So you have everywhere these Doppler radars to see where, where it's going to rain and how the clouds are moving. But actually you can see bird migration on that. So if you have a big flock of birds, um, <clears throat> you can see them go up or, or land uh, in the evening or in the morning. Actually they fly in 
in, in the night often. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the cool thing is that um, this can, so if, you, if we now train neural networks to actually recognize it and predict how they are flying, because you know, not all of Europe is covered by these Doppler radars, so you, you see them disappear from one grid point and appear somewhere else. And if you can predict when they are going, depending on the weather and, and, and the terrain, etc. For example, you can use that now to um, stop uh, windmills in the North Sea when you mm -hmm. see that the, the birds are coming over, right? And um, apparently these, these, uh, these wind, windmill parks, they kill a lot of birds. And uh, so it's a great opportunity to use data for something, that, uh, something completely different, uh, thanks to mm -hmm. uh, this machine learning uh, algorithms. Yeah, nice, yeah. nice. Christoph, how do, do you look at uh, new opportunities? Yeah, I think it, it, it's, there are quite a few. So uh, <laughs> um, I, I mentioned this uh, inverse problem, right? So this, this working back fro from observations to, to data. What, what's really exciting about doing it with neural networks is um, that, that we can make physics models more realistic when we want to describe data. Often uh, traditional meth methods force us to to do kind of or use this kind of spherical cow uh, idea of we have to keep our models simple enough to actually compare them with data with the algorithms that we have. Mm -hmm. One example is, for instance, I, I showed this, this gamma ray data. So one can look for for dark matter signals by looking at the galactic center at gamma ray energies. But it's a very difficult process. One has to peel off all the astrophysical emission. And traditionally, this has been done with traditional techniques that have like very few parameters, in some sense, simple models. And uh, with simulation-based inference, we, we can just basically go the full way, take into account all uncertainties, all that we know compared with data in a systematic way. And um, so that's one aspect, and it applies to basically all modeling problems. Um, another aspect is that the very techniques that we use to train neural networks, basically stochastic gradient descent, auto differentiation, they can be also used to, to solve other completely different optimization problems in physics, like optimizing triggers for collider physics, or finding compactifications for string theory, or modeling strong lensing images. And all these things are just like being discovered, basically, by people using these tools. And that's, that's very interesting. Mm. OK, so lots of opportunities. So we have a few minutes left. So we can have, have a quick look at the future. Uh, we have one uh, question for the audience and also uh, in parallel uh, the question for um, uh, the panel. Um, I don't know if we have the Menti online. I don't... Is it... Yeah, so the, the, the question is um, to the audience and to the panel, what are you expecting 10 years from now? So not uh, what, what, what do you see as opportunities today, but how will it transform science uh, on the long run. So, um, and I took uh, some of the um, possible answers from the AI for Science um, uh, report from uh, Rick Stevens. Um, so, for example, learned models begin to replace data. Is that something that uh, will happen? Uh, experimental discovery process will be revised. So, models replace experiments, Im experiments improve models. Um, will simulation and AI approaches merge? Uh, will theory become data for the next generation AI? Or will AI become a common part of the scientific laboratory activities? So what would you say in, um, well, which of, the, which of the options would you uh, choose? Uh, which of the two options would you choose, uh, Bernd? Yeah, so Any idea? Yeah, actually, yeah, not, none of them, actually. I think that 10 years from now, um, Facebook AI and Google uh, DeepMind will merge and discover that it's too expensive to build a Dyson uh, sphere around the sun. And it's better <laughs> to use uh, humans as batteries, and then uh, we start looking for a guy called Nemo in, in the Matrix, I think. No, but seriously, um, so what the, the first thing that popped up, now it gets smaller again, is the simulation and AI approaches merge. And so the development of end-to-end -end differentiable simulations is, is going to fly, I think. And so, yeah, I really see that as uh, something that will become standard and allows us to couple models together. And uh, that will be great for, for physics, I think, and, and, well, and also for chemistry and for mm -hmm. sciences. Yeah. Yes, we have uh, a few seconds left. So I go to Christoph. Do you, would you see also that uh, the answers from the audience, uh, so the experimental 
uh, discovery process is revised and uh, AI becomes really common in scientific research, is that? Yeah, I, th I certainly think that AI will play a role in designing experiments in the future because it can be efficiently used to optimize them, but also that it will become a very common uh, ID tool set for scientific discovery and uh, for analyzing data. And I completely agree with uh, what Bernd said about differential programming. So this idea of merging uh, neural nets with physical simulators all in, in, in a single unit has great potential. Well, that's great stuff for further discussion. I'm sorry, Francesco, we're running out of time, so we'll have to hear your opinion uh, on this uh, um, uh, offline. So I would like to thank uh, Francesco, uh, Bernd and Christoph very much for uh, this interesting discussion. I would also like the, the audience for listening and for your input. And uh, uh, thanks and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.